I came here with nothing and all that you've given me. Good words. I started worshiping over there. I almost forgot where we were at in the service. Amen. We are about to prepare our hearts to share communion together this morning. And I'm going to ask that you stand for the reading of God's Word, if you'd stand one more time, please. Reading from Deuteronomy 6, verse 23, the Word of the Lord says this. Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in. Can you say praise God for that? (laughs) I don't know where your there was, but mine was pretty dark. He brought us out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers. And that's what I want to talk to you for a little bit about this morning as we prepare our hearts for communion, a message I've entitled, He Brought Us Out to Bring Us In. Would you bow your heads, please? Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now to ask, Lord God, that the lamp of your word, that the candle of your Holy Spirit would search our hearts and our minds and our souls this morning, Lord. Lord, we come to the table of the Lord. You turned to the disciples one day and you said to them and to the multitudes, except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part in me. Lord, your word says that the multitudes turned away at that point. They were there for the loaves and the fishes and the miracles and the signs and the wonders. But God, they were not there to love you, to serve you, to honor you with their hearts and with their lives. And even your disciples said, Lord, that's a hard saying. Who can hear that? God, I thank you this morning that by the shed blood of Jesus Christ for our forgiveness. By the outpouring and shedding forth of the Holy Spirit to empower us, Lord God, we can come to the table of the Lord and eat of it worthily because of your great love and your grace and your goodness. Father, your word also warns us that when we come to the table of the Lord, that God, we dare not eat it unworthily. That is, with unrepentant sin, with unforgiveness in our hearts or bitterness. And you said, Lord God, if we do that, that many of us will end up sick and some even die. So, Father, let us come with hearts that fear and tremble before you and your word. And God, let us honor you today as we give ourselves again to the covenant, Lord God, of your body and your blood through communion this morning. Lord, touch our hearts and souls and help us to search our lives and our souls this morning, Lord. Lord, not with our own guilt, not with the enemy's condemnation, but with the light and judgment of your word on each one of our hearts. Because, Father, you will judge us, but you will heal us and forgive us and cleanse us and make us whole again. But, Lord, help us to be open and honest and to bear our hearts and souls before you. And let your word have free course and be glorified in our lives is our prayer. And Lord, we ask these things in that name that because of his sacrifice prevails above every name. The name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. You may be seated. We are going to be taking in some new members today and they have some of their family with them as our guests and we're just delighted to have you with us and We have others that have been through 15 hours of discipleship and training, and many of them are already working and serving Christ in the church and in their daily lives, and some of the rest of them are going to sign up and do some more. Glory to God. Jesus said, go into all the world and not only preach the gospel, but to preach and to teach and to instruct them to obey all things whatsoever God has commanded us. So today, along with that, we're going to be sharing in communion. Communion is symbolic of our being forgiven and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. (laughs) What can wash away my sins? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? No matter what our pain, no matter what our hurt, no matter what our struggle, 
no matter what crisis we're going through in our lives, nothing, nothing can heal like the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Communion is symbolic of his forgiveness, washed in his blood because of his atoning sacrifice. Jesus went to the cross for you, and he went to the cross for me. He went there because we could not save ourselves. We could not earn our way into heaven. Nobody could make up for the sins that you and I committed and every other human being because the Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he knew that, and though heaven would pull the veil of darkness and angels would shudder in horror as he hung there to die for you and I, the Bible said he was obedient even unto the death of the cross because he knew there was no other way for you to be saved and for me to be saved. And it is also symbolic of our unity and oneness of walking with Christ. When Jesus said to his disciples, except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, he wasn't starting some strange cannibal cult. What he was saying to them is, is that you and I need to become one in spirit. We need to become one in nature. We need to become one in personality. We need to become one in together, in God's love. That's what he was saying. And when we do, and we take communion, it is a symbol and a sign to ourselves, to everyone around us, to the world that we believe with all of our hearts that Christ not only died for us, was buried and rose again, but that he resurrected from the grave, that he went back to seat at the right hand of the Father, where he ever lives to make intercession for you and I, and that one day he's going to come back to this miserable world, such as it is, and those who love him and love his appearing are going to be going home with him and all those that have went on before us. Glory to God. I'm glad you're awake this morning. I didn't want to preach this by myself. <laughs> We're awaiting his return and the resurrection to eternal life. Jesus said, those that believe in me, though they were dead, yet shall they live. I don't know about you, but I got some loved ones that have went on before me, and I miss them, and I miss them a lot, but I'm going to see them again one day. Glory to God. In my opening text, it says he brought us out that he might bring us in. And to really understand what God is saying there, we need to go back a few verses. Moses, for the second time, the word Deuteronomy means second law. That's what it means, duo. It's double. Deuteronomy, Moses is giving Israel, for the second time, their instructions about how to walk and live and walk with God and have a relationship with God. And Moses says this to Israel. He said, when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is the meaning of the testimonies, the statues, and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you, then you shall say to your son, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Amen. Amen. <laughs> You say, well, that's history, that's the Bible, that's Old Testament. Let me tell you something, that's as real as you and I sitting here today. Pharaoh represented the power literally of the devil. He had a turban on his head and there was a big snake on the turban, a big cobra up on his head and he was Pharaoh or literally Pharaoh. He was the son of Ra, the sun god. You know what Pharaoh literally means? the incarnate son of the angel of light. Which when you get over in the New Testament, you find out that's another name for old Slewfoot himself. Paul warns us in the New Testament not to listen to everybody that says they're a Bible preacher, but to listen to only those who know the Word and preach the Word and preach the truth of the Word. Because he said, even Jesus saw the devil fall from heaven as lightning. And he said, even the apostles of, of Christ can be devils if you don't know your Bible. Read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. You knew I was going to get to that sooner or later, right? Read your Bible. But Pharaoh and Egypt represent bondage and slavery. That's why Israel went there. God was trying to teach the world that not only do we have things that enslave us in this life, but we've got a spiritual enemy that is always trying to enslave us. 
Jesus said, your enemy, the devil, he came to kill and to steal and to destroy in your life. But Jesus came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. He came to set you free from Pharaoh. He came to set you free from Egypt. He came to set you free from the enemy of your soul and the enemy of this world. And that's what we're celebrating when we celebrate communion. We are once again inaugurating the covenant with Jesus and saying, thank God Almighty, you set me free. You know, as Martin Luther King said, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last, I'm free at last, I'm free at last. He really is free. He's home. <laughs> but you and I can be free in Jesus Christ as well. And if you think about it, those of us that know him as our Savior and our Lord and our friend and our comforter and our counselor, those of us that know him, we know that he set us free. We know what our lives used to be. Somebody said something to me yesterday. They, or no, it was the day before. They said, uh, well, they were complimenting me on something. They said, we don't want to blow your head up. I said, no problem. I said, I know what I am without Christ. <laughs> I know what he brought me out of. I know who I was. I know every good and perfect gift and every good and thing that's in my life is because of Jesus Christ. You wouldn't even have been in the same room with me before I got saved, most of you. Oh, thank God he sets us free. <laughs> He said, you shall say to your son, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. Then he says, then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in to the land that he's promised us. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statues to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. If you've not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and committed your life to live from him, for him, the devil, <laughs> yeah, and from him, and in him, and by him, amen. But if you've not done that, the devil will what lies to all of us, and he says, you know, you really can't live life the way God wants you to live because if you do, you're going to suffer somehow. You're going to have to, you know, you're going to lose out some way, somehow. Everything's going to be less than it was before you came to Christ. That's the biggest lie that hell probably has ever told besides you won't die if you eat that fruit. The reality is God wants us to keep his word. Why? Because his statues, his commandments are for our good always. They're for our good. I know people who look at Scripture and they just do what they think they have to do to get by when it comes to obeying the Word of God. I feel sorry for you because you're never going to know all that God has for you if you live that way. You'll never know that every word, every promise, Every jot, every tittle is yes and amen to the glory of God and to the goodness of your life if you will live the way God wants you to live and live by his word. I was talking to a Bible study this week. I said it's hard to live by God's word. You know why? Because God's word is not the ways of the world. It's not the philosophies of the world. It's not the ideas of the world. And see, you have that projected at you all the time, whether it's your smartphone, whether it's the, you know, the news, whether it's the music you listen to, all the philosophy of the world. God said, don't go that way. That's the way of darkness and lostness. Follow Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he came that you might have life and have it more abundantly if you'll just do it all his way. <laughs> Amen. Then it will be righteousness for us, it says. If we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he commanded us, God will bless us. God will heal us. God will save us. God will touch us. God will give us wisdom and he'll give us direction and he'll heal every area and every part of our lives. I believe, I still believe, we sang it earlier, <laughs> that God is still God and he's still setting the captives free, glory to God. He's setting the drug addict free and the alcoholic free and the religious church people free. Yeah. You can go to church and still go to hell. You know that, don't you? 
Just coming to church don't make you a Christian anymore and going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Or going to the car worse makes you a car. It's about a relationship with God, walking and living and breathing and talking and sharing life with Him and doing what His Word says to do in your life. Jesus said, if you will love him, you will keep his commandments. And if you will keep his commandments, he said, I and the Father will come to you and manifest ourselves to you. <laughs> if you're new to all this, I don't want to scare you to death, but you're in a room full of people that see God, hear God, walk with God, know God. Amen. Amen. He's there when we rise up in the morning. He's there when we're out playing. He's there when we're working. He's there when we're praying. He's there when we go to bed. He's there sometimes we even forget that he's there. He reminds us that he's there. <laughs> Amen. He surprises us by joy over and over again. We go through trials and tribulations just like anybody else in the world, but he always gets us through. Even in our darkest moments when we just think there's nothing else left, nothing else that we can do, he shows up every time. Glory to God. He is the light of the world. <laughs> Glory to God. And he said, if you do these things, this will be your righteousness. Your right standing with God. Just love God with all your heart, your neighbor as yourself, and learn to keep his commandments. You can't learn them if you don't read them. But if you will read them and put them into practice and obey what they said, you will have an abundant life in this life and eternal life in the life to come. Sister Kathy, we're going anyway. I told my family one time, I said, I'm going to do everything I can to get you to heaven, but even if none of you go, I'm going. My mind's set. If there ain't but one person here today that has got their mind made up that they're going to heaven, I feel sorry for all of you people because I'm going. Not because I'm so good and I'm so right, but because Jesus loved me so much, he died for me, and he gave me his word that I might walk with him and know him and live in this life and make it through this life into eternity. 1 John 5, 13 says, These things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. It's a no-so thing. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm done preaching for a little bit. <laughs> I think. Those of you that are going to serve communion, I'd like you to come. And we're going to share the communion elements together. What they're going to do is they're going to come up and they're going to serve you the communion elements. I'm going to ask the worship team to come to the platform if you would. They're going to serve you the communion elements, and I want you to hold on to them because we're all going to take them together in just a few moments. Amen. You can go ahead and put the lights down, sister. Thank you. I was supposed to get the worship team up here sooner, but I didn't. If you're not saved this morning, you need to be right where you sit. Most people around you can't see that far, especially in the dark. So you don't have to worry about being embarrassed or ashamed or anything. You just need to bow your head as we worship before the Lord right now. And you need to say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner because all of sin to come short of the glory of God. And God, I've been living life my way, but I want to live it your way. Now here's the deal. You've got to mean that from the bottom of your heart. And then you've got to follow through with the rest of your life. Because, you know, you don't get a Band-Aid prayer. It's not an insurance policy. You just say a prayer and, you know, get your ticket stamped and you're in. It's not like that. You bring your whole life to him and say, God, I've went my way. Now I want to go your way. But if you'll say that simple prayer, God, forgive me. Come into my heart and life. And as I take communion today, God, let this be the beginning of my walk with you. He'll save you. He'll heal you. He'll give you direction. And he'll heal every part of your life and everywhere that you hurt. Brother Steve was talking about his dentist earlier. You know what I thought the first time he said about healing the soul and Steve said I don't know about that I thought me and Steve must never have an abscess tooth I believe that goes all the way to the soul <laughs> that's exactly what I thought but you know even if an abscess tooth doesn't do that the things that we encounter life do they go to the soul and the marrow and the inside of us until we just get broken and God wants to heal every part of you and Christian, if you're here this morning and, you know, things just aren't, haven't been where they need to be between you and God lately, this is the time before we take communion to bow your head and say, God, you know, you and I need, need to talk. 
I need to ask some forgiveness here, Lord, and I, I want to get set back on the right path, and I want to get in the right direction. And when you take communion, say, Lord, I'm going to eat of your flesh, and I'm going to drink of your blood. And you said if I do that and I'd be one with you, I'd be healed. And I'm telling you, God will do miraculous things here today if you let him. Amen. All right, they're going to serve you. We're going to worship, and I want you to worship with us. The reckless, overwhelming, never-ending love of God. He was reckless enough to give us a choice. Reckless enough to go to the cross even before he knew whether anyone would respond to it or not because of his overwhelming love for us. I want to read some scripture to you before we share communion together. In John 17, Jesus was getting ready to share the Last Supper with his disciples. And it was the night before his crucifixion, and he prayed for them, and in their presence, and it says this, Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. I want to share with you that Jesus has authority over all flesh. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with, what your addiction is. Jesus Christ is the answer to your life, and he has the power to set you free. He said, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world, and they were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. People ask me all the time, they say, Preacher, how do you know God's real? I say, I met him. And their eyeballs get about that big around, and they say, really? I said, yes. I say, you can meet him too, and the Word says that we live and move and have our being in him. In fact, when you get to the place to surrender your life and you actually do meet him by asking him to come in your heart and life, you're going to realize that you've known him your whole life. It's just your eyes weren't open enough to see it. Because he loves us so much, he chases us from the, from the cradle to the grave to try to win our hearts to him. And when you begin to read his word and you keep his word, your eyes get open. And you really see God. I'm not talking about schizophrenia. I'm not talking about voices out of the sky. I'm talking about a voice that speaks to your heart that when you hear it, you know it because you were created to hear it. It's the voice of the shepherd and, and that voice speaks to you and you say, that's home. That's what I've been looking for. I hear the voice of home. He said, for I have given to them the words which you've given me and they've received them and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I had an atheist about a year ago trying to disprove the Bible to him. You know what I told him? I said, you got to me way too late. <laughs> you know, if you'd have talked to me when I was blinded by drugs, if you'd have talked to me when I was blinded by my own selfishness and self-centeredness, and I wouldn't have been able to see nothing, but you got to me too late. I told him this. I said, you can tear every page of the book up. He's trying to tell me some things he didn't think were, you know, historical or something. I said, you can tear every page out of the book and throw the book away. It is too late to get to me. I am too far gone. I have met the Savior. He is so real to me and so much a part of my life. I said, he's not bound in the book. He himself said that. He himself said that. He said, scribes and Pharisees said, you search the Scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And there's a lot of religious people that think that. You search the Word to bring you to Him. 
He's alive and well and resurrected. Glory to God. Jesus said, I pray for them. He's praying for the disciples. He said, I do not pray for the whole world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. You're sitting in a house with a lot of people who belong to Jesus. He is mine, and I am his. He's the love of our lives. Most of us are married, but Jesus is the first love of our lives. Our spouses don't mind because they're that in love with him too. He said, now I am no longer in the world because he was getting ready to leave, Jesus. But these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me. When we just think there's nothing else left, nothing else that we can do, he shows up every time. Glory to God. He is the light of the world. <laughs> Glory to God. And he said, if you do these things, this will be your righteousness, your right standing with God. Just love God with all your heart, your neighbor as yourself, and learn to keep his commandments. You can't learn them if you don't read them. But if you will read them and put them into practice and obey what they said, you will have an abundant life in this life and eternal life in the life to come. Sister Kathy, we're going anyway. I told my family one time, I said, I'm going to do everything I can to get you to heaven, but even if none of you go, I'm going. My mind's set. If there ain't but one person here today that has got their mind made up that they're going to heaven, I feel sorry for all of you people because I'm going. Not because I'm so good and I'm so right, but because Jesus loved me so much, he died for me, and he gave me his word that I might walk with him and know him and live in this life and make it through this life into eternity. 1 John 5, 13 says, These things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. It's a no-so thing. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm done preaching for a little bit. I think. Those of you that are going to serve communion, I'd like you to come, and we're going to share the communion elements together. What they're going to do is they're going to come up, and they're going to serve you the communion elements. I'm going to ask the worship team to come platform, if you would. They're going to serve you the communion elements, and I want you to hold on to them, because we're all going to take them together in just a few moments. Amen. You can go ahead and put the lights down, sister. Thank you. I was supposed to get the worship team up here sooner, but I didn't. If you're not saved this morning, you need to be right where you sit. Most people around you can't see that far, especially in the dark. So you don't have to worry about being embarrassed or ashamed or anything. You just need to bow your head as we worship before the Lord right now, and you need to say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner because all of sin to come short of the glory of God. And God, I've been living life my way, but I want to live it your way. Now, here's the deal. You've got to mean that from the bottom of your heart, and then you've got to follow through with the rest of your life because, you know, you don't get a Band-Aid prayer. It's not an insurance policy. You just say a prayer and, you know, get your ticket stamped and you're in. It's not like that. You bring your whole life to him and say, God, I've went my way. Now I want to go your way. But if you'll say that simple prayer, God, forgive me. Come into my heart and life. And as I take communion today, God, let this be the beginning of my walk with you. He'll save you. He'll heal you. He'll give you direction, and he'll heal every part of your life and everywhere that you hurt. Brother Steve was talking about his dentist earlier. You know what I thought the first time he said about healing the soul? And Steve said, I don't know about that. I thought, man, Steve must never have an abscess tooth. I believe that goes all the way to the soul. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. But, you know, even if an abscess tooth doesn't do that, the things that we encounter in life do. They go to the soul and the marrow and the inside of us until we just get broken. And God wants to heal every part of you. And Christian, if you're here this morning and, you know, things just aren't, haven't been where they need to be between you and God lately, this is the time before we take communion to bow your head and say, God, you know, you and I need, need to talk. And I need to ask some forgiveness here, Lord, and I... I want to get set back on the right path, and I want to get in the right direction. And when you take communion, say, Lord, 
I'm going to eat of your flesh and I'm going to drink of your blood. And you said if I do that and I'd be one with you, I'd be healed. And I'm telling you, God will do miraculous things here today if you let him. Amen. All right, they're going to serve you. We're going to worship, and I want you to worship with us.
Thank you, worship team. The reckless, overwhelming, never-ending love of God. He was reckless enough to give us a choice. Reckless enough to go to the cross even before he knew whether anyone would respond to it or not of his overwhelming love for us. I want to read some scripture to you before we share communion together. In John 17, Jesus was getting ready to share the Last Supper with his disciples. And it was the night before his crucifixion, and he prayed for them, and in their presence, and it says this, Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. I want to share with you that Jesus has authority over all flesh. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with, what your addiction is. Jesus Christ is the answer to your life, and he has the power to set you free. He said, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. And they were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. People ask me all the time, they say, Preacher, how do you know God's real? I say, I met him. And their eyeballs get about that big around, and they say, Really? I said, Yes. I say, You can meet him too, and... The Word says that we live and move and have our being in Him. In fact, when you get to the place to surrender your life and you actually do meet Him by asking Him to come in your heart and life, you're going to realize that you've known Him your whole life. It's just your eyes weren't open enough to see it. Because He loves us so much, He chases us from the, from the cradle to the grave to try to win our hearts to Him. And when you begin to read His Word and you keep His Word, your eyes get open and you really see God. I'm not talking about schizophrenia. I'm not talking about voices out of the sky. I'm talking about a voice that speaks to your heart that when you hear it, you know it because you were created to hear it. It's the voice of the shepherd and, and that voice speaks to you and you say, that's home. That's what I've been looking for. I hear the voice of home. He said, For I have given to them the words which you've given me, and they've received them and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I had an atheist about a year ago trying to disprove the Bible to him. You know what I told him? I said, You got to me way too late. <laughs> You know, if you'd have talked to me when I was blinded by drugs, if you'd have talked to me when I was blinded by my own selfishness and self-centeredness, and I wouldn't have been able to see nothing, but you got to me too late. I told him this. I said, you can tear every page of the book up. He's trying to tell me some things he didn't think were, you know, historical or something. I said, you can tear every page out of the book and throw the book away. It is too late to get to me. I am too far gone. I have met the Savior. He is so real to me and so much a part of my life. I said, he's not bound in the book. He himself said that. 
He himself said that. He said, scribes and Pharisees, he said, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And there's a lot of religious people that think that. You search the word to bring you to him. He's alive and well and resurrected. Glory to God. Jesus said, I pray for them. He's praying for the disciples. He said, I do not pray for the whole world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours. And yours are mine. And I'm glorified in them. You're sitting in a house with a lot of people who belong to Jesus. He is mine. And I am his. He's the love of our lives. Most of us are married, but Jesus is the first love of our lives. Our spouses don't mind because they're that in love with him too. He said, now I am no longer in the world because he was getting ready to leave, Jesus. But these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world... I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I've kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled, and even that was his choice. He knew better. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. You'll never be happier, more at peace, more at whole than when you give your heart to Christ and live and walk for Him. I know, I tried everything the world had to offer. I still ended up sick, worried, depressed, suicidal. And I came to Jesus, and He's all you need. He is everything that you need. He said, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. God picks us up, cleans us up, takes us out of the world. You know why? Because he brought us out to bring us in. To bring us into the kingdom. This world's in a mess. It is. The whole world is in a mess. And the people that are leading it all over the whole world, not just here, but all over the whole world, they get just a little bit crazier every day. Creation is in a mess. All of it. But the kingdom of God is not. And while you're in this life, the kingdom of God is within you. And one day, it's going to be the only thing that exists. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and a new creation. That's why he's bringing us out of this world to live for him, to take us into that one. He said, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. You know, the word of God works the same way for us as it did for Jesus. If you will live for God and live in His Word, it will have a sanctifying, cleansing effect on everyone else around you that knows you. Every place that you go, everything that you do. So much so that Jesus said, you will be the light and the salt of the earth. Without your presence as a child of God, He said it wouldn't be worth existing or having here. And I like this next part. He said, I do not pray for these alone. Jesus is talking to his Father. He said, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Praying for me. and Praying for you. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. God so changes our lives that others can see God through us, the ones that still can't see Him. He's everywhere, but they can't see Him. And God needs you, who can see Him, to live for Him and obey Him so that those that are still lost in darkness will be able to see Him. That's what He's telling you. He said, "In the glory which you gave me, I have given them, 
that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you've loved me. God loves his children, doesn't he? He does. If you will love him and serve him, he will make you feel like an only child. My sister Susie and I, we argue about, we got sibling rivalry about, you know, who mom loves best. She showed up at the memorial picnic. She said, I got a t-shirt for you. I put it on and said, mom's favorite. (laughs) But then she showed up a little later with, I am really mom's favorite (laughs) on hers. My mother doesn't play favorites, I can tell you. You know who my, who my mother's favorite always was? There was seven of us. Whichever one needed us the most at the time. That's who her favorite is. Don't tell the rest of them, Susie. <laughs> Father, Jesus said, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. He's talking about heaven. Father, I want him to be where I am. But that's not all he's talking about. See, because he has, for several verses now, been saying, Father, I want you to help them to become one with me, just as I am one with you, that they can be one with us so that they can see your glory. (laughs) We walk in the light of God's glory and love, don't we? As his children, you do. Now, I was about as lost as you could be the first time I went to church and first time I saw people raising their hands to God, I was sitting on the back row and hair down to about here and stoned. And they started raising their hands. I thought, my God, who do they think they are? I really down inside was thinking this too. I thought, don't raise your hands. He'll realize I'm in here and hit me with a lightning bolt. I tell people all the time, I say, you don't have to worry about the roof caving in. I came in front of you. If it was coming down, it would have been down already. But you know what? I found out after I gave my life to him that he loves us. We are his favorite. He said, you are a treasure. You are my chosen treasure, my chosen possession. He said, Your name is written on the palms of my hand. And he said, I know what you think you are, but one of these days I'm going to give you a white white stone that nobody else has ever seen, and it's going to have what I thought you were on written on it. A name that no man knows, it says. Because of what he's done in us. O righteous Father, Jesus said, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it. And the love with which you love me, that it may be in them and I in them. You know how you'll know a real child of God? They love everybody. They hate nobody. They forgive everybody. They do. They do. We have to. I don't do this very often, but I got a little honorary streak. Sometimes people say, I love you. I say, you have to. If you want to make heaven your home, you have to. Jesus said, love even your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. You can't do that in your own humanness, but you can do that when you love and obey God and let his spirit reign in your life. And we are going to share communion right now, or at least try to. Shay, did you get your cup? You got it? All right. When we are taking communion... We are saying to God and to each other around us that I believe from the bottom of my heart that God sent His Son to die on the cross in my place to take the punishment and the penalty for all of my sins. And I believe He resurrected Him from the grave to show to me and to the rest of the world that he had not sinned, that he was a spotless lamb, that he was a sacrifice accepted by God in our place. And I also believe that he was resurrected. I believe in my heart that he was crucified, buried, and resurrected. 
And because of that, I am going to symbolically eat of his flesh, drink of his blood, and I am choosing to be one with him for the rest of my life. I'm going to learn to live and grow and obey the word of God. And I'm going to let him open my eyes so that I can see him. And if I'm a Christian already and I've been walking with him, it's just a good time to say, God, I love you this much again. Jesus, I come and lay it all at your feet again. God can heal you body, soul, mind, spirit, addiction, trial, tribulation, circumstance. He came to seek and to save that which was lost, and we've all been lost at one time or another. So would you take the bread, first of all, in your hand and just hold it up for a second? And I want to pray over it. Heavenly Father, because of your Son, Lord, we can lift our eyes to heaven without shame, without fear. We can come boldly, your word says, to the throne of grace, like a little child running into the arms of its father and its grandfather. Lord, because of the wrath that once hung over us, your Son went to the cross and gave his body to suffer and die in our place, Lord, to receive that judgment and to make atonement for us. And Lord God, we come to give our hearts and lives to you anew and afresh this morning. We ask your blessing on this bread as we partake of it. Bless it to our hearts, to our soul, to our body, and to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's eat of it together. I want you to take the cup and hold it up. Holy Father, we just come before you right now to lift up this cup of the fruit of the vine, Lord, that represents the blood of your Son that flowed out of his body for hours as he was tortured and tried and tested by the enemy of our souls. Jesus, we thank you that you were faithful unto death, even unto the death of the cross. You showed us through your suffering and your crucifixion just how cruel the enemy of our lives is. As God the Father, had to pull the veil and the curtain, Lord. And darkness filled this universe while your son hung there, suffering and bleeding and dying and even more than that, Father, separated from you while angels looked on in horror, not understanding and not knowing at that moment, Lord God, why you didn't call for 12,000 legions of angels to go and to deliver him, Lord God. Father, you showed us through your Son that even while we were yet sinners, you loved us enough to let your Son suffer and die in our place, Lord God, that we might be forgiven, that we might be brought back to you. That, God, we might have the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us to deal with all of the struggles and the trial and the onslaught of the enemy as we go through this world and to one day be able to look death itself in the face and say through the blood of Jesus Christ, death, hell, and the grave has no power over us, Lord God, because we believe in you, though we were dead, yet shall we live. And Lord God, we thank you that as your blood flowed from Calvary, Lord, you opened up that river from the throne of God that is clear as crystal, that Lord, whosoever would could come and drink freely of the water of life, could come without money, could come without works, that could come without religion, Lord God. And Father, drink of the waters of life freely. 
Because you bled and died, Lord God, you brought us back into covenant with our God. And Lord Jesus, we worship you this morning. Lord, as we partake of this cup, symbolic of your blood that's poured out, reach all over this sanctuary, heal the sick, raise the dead, open the eyes of the blind, and God, let the gospel be preached to the poor. May they have heard it this morning and surrender their hearts and lives to you. Oh, Lord Jesus, we love you and praise you. Bless this cup to every part of our being as we partake of it in Jesus' name. Let's partake of it, church. Oh, Lord God. All that you are to us, all that you mean to us, Jesus. We honor you this morning. We worship you. We give thanks and praise. It is your arm that has saved us and redeemed us, that has brought us out of darkness into light, out of death into life. Lord, that has lifted us up out of the miry clay in the pit. And Lord, put our feet on the rock of your word and your will. Lord, we love you and praise you. Lord, I pray that praises are going up from your church all around this planet right now as we worship you on this Lord's day. And Father, I ask these things in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you and we glorify your name. We truly are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the mighty Jehovah, the everlasting Prince of peace. Father, we worship you and we, we glorify your name, Lord. Father, we thank you for taking communion today to remember what you've done for us and remember what you're going to do for us, Lord God. We thank you for the word that was preached here today, Lord God. Father, let us not only be hearers, but doers of your word, Lord God. Father, I speak over your people now. Father, make them the head and not the tail. Bless them as they come in and bless them as they go out. Prosper them in all that they do. Let there be great signs, wonders, and miracles follow them all the days of their life. And I speak divine health over every person in this room. Father, we love you and we praise you and we glorify your name. Father, remind the people this week how much you love them. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless.